to be at a conference on the postcard city uh, that is dedicated to this theme uh, is like a dream coming uh, true for me, uh, running an organization called Smarter Than Car. Um, you, will, you will know briefly why this is the case. So we are um, a sort of urban agency uh, and strategy group, um, which, which has a very strong uh, advocacy background, but, but we are sort of doing interdisciplinary planning and communications. We, we have, um, most of us have day jobs, and then they, they engage uh, in, in the, the work at Smarter Than Car, uh, when, when there is time or when we set up for projects. So we, we differ uh, in, uh, in sort of um, people that are involved, uh, but also today's talk is, is very much based on the work of my colleagues. Uh, so so I'm, I'm always uh, referencing that, you know, it's not only myself being behind that, of course. Um, what, is, uh, what is the idea be behind uh, our work is, of course, um, that that we, that we are having a system where, where uh, the, the ownership and the, the, the existence of cars in the world is, is growing increasingly. And if we continue uh, in, in this way, we are sort of uh, building our nightmare and not our dreams. Uh, as some producers uh, are, are trying to sell us the car with, and we will, we will go also a bit into the history of, of uh, how this, this thing is sold. Um, how the car as an item is sold to us and we believe that we uh, simply must be smarter than car uh, in our cities. So uh, of course in our cities the, the human is sort of reduced to, uh, to very small spaces, literally, um, such as here in Hong Kong we, we have uh, car-oriented urbanism such as here in, in uh, Ciudad de Mexico. Um, and we live in a world that is uh, dominated by uh, what we call Anthropocene urbanism. Uh, it's basically an urbanism uh, on steroids and the steroid is uh, cheap fossil energy uh, and it's held together by the, the use of, of the privately used car, but as we also discussed yesterday, uh, this usage is uh, not at all uh, a private matter, it's a very public matter and it's a matter that concerns our uh, sustainable um, further existence in, in the world actually. This uh, example is, um, uh, is Cape, Cape Coral uh, in Florida and it's the fastest growing uh, city, uh, if you want to call something like that a city, uh, in the United States. Um, it's, um, it's, a, it's an example, you can read into it, there is a very good article online. I'm not sure, is it too loud for you, for you guys? Um, um, it's, a, it's an example, it, it has been uh, created by, by two brothers, sort of uh, investors um, that, that wanted to make money on, on sort of sketchy premises, sold in a very aggressive way. Uh, and of course, there was a lot of uh, mortgage problems in these communities and it runs into very serious ecological uh, problems at the moment. It has, a few weeks ago, it has been just passed by, uh, by Hurricane Irma, like a uh, very, just, uh, Irma just passed by basically uh, and, and catastrophe was avoided. But this is sort of like, um, it's, it's not sustainable at all, this, this model uh, of, of a city, but it's an extreme example. So uh, what they did was to um, uh, transfer or convert these, these mangroves uh, basically into wa what they call waterfront property that could be sold uh, very easily. But, and of course, you have no, that no, one of the main problems is that they don't have any other use than residential. So you basically live out of your fridge that you fill up uh, uh, every now and then using your car. Uh, but it's not only in Florida that we, that we are running this model. This is uh, my hometown, Vienna. Uh, on the fringe of Vienna, this is uh, a very recent development where, where you see this is uh, also in very forward-looking uh, cities that are also uh, quoted for, for, for being smart or something. This is things that are still happen. Uh, and this is a sort of a, also has to do with, with governance and... and uh, planning uh, hierarchies. This is a, a development, a very large shopping center, but it has been created just outside of the city border of Vienna. So the city of Vienna had uh, not really uh, any way to intervene in here, 
but of course uh, it's these fringe uh, city situations where where um, where different planning goals sort of uh, um, don't, don't match up you know and and sometimes um, lead to difficult outcomes of course this is a model that is uh, that is um, appreciated by by the users as such but uh, its sustainability is questionable and I want to uh, focus a little bit on on this question of power, but not uh, as you might um, as you might um, think on political power or power of planners uh, per se, but the question of uh, of sort of energy that uh, that enables this. So the the question about fuel uh, and um, and I think we we can be very bold in what we are doing because this is sort of like. Uh, I'm, I'm educated also as a, as a planetary scientist, as an ecologist, um, so I'm, I'm always having this perspective in mind. And this is, a, um, this is based on, on work of, uh, of natural scientists, but it basically uh, shows the sort of uh, energy conversion that we are able to, to achieve over time. So in the, in the early days uh, of hunter-gatherers, basically one one human was the unit of energy conversion. You could only do something on your own. And then by the time we used, we started to use animals for work, we could uh, mobilize a little bit more energy, of course, and then more and more energy with, with, the, uh, with the using water power and uh, early um, human sort of urban settlements, such as, such as in China, they, they were very based on having this technology available. Or uh, in the Dutch context, for example, uh, this was, of course, a little bit later, around this time. Uh, the, the use of these technologies was very important to maintain a sort of urban condition. But you can see that this is basically, uh, for a long time, it has been staying very low. But we, we are now in this age of fossil fuels where we where it sort of completely exploded the, the, the amount of energy that we can mobilize. And nowadays, you can mobilize with one gas turbine uh, in a power plant. You can use 15 million times uh, as much energy as the hunter-gatherers could mobilize by, by sort of uh, application. Uh, uh, and, and of course, this is a very important um, thing here. It's one oil barrel. It contains the amount of work that about 23,000 people would, would be able to do. Um, so uh, another interesting aspect is that we are, when we, when we think about energy as something you know, energy is, is not going away. It's only transformed from one form to another. So um, it's, it's, it can be something like a constant. And when you think about uh, what uh, nowadays uh, a sort of suburban home uh, is using that has 400 square meters uh, of living space and it has three cars and about 80 power outlets where you can, where you can mobilize uh, your, your appliances, this is the same, this amounts to about half a megawatt of energy that is available that you can sort of uh, have, have your power over that you can sort of uh, decide upon uh, as a suburban family. And this is the same amount of energy that, uh, that the Roman Latifundia was, was able to mobilize with about 6,000 slaves or uh, a 19th century manor with uh, 3,000 servants and 400 draft horses. So it's really like this, this dream of, of being able to, on, on the sort of switch of a button, to, to mobilize a lot of energy. But this is uh, questionable if this is sustainable. And of course, the, the sort of the epiphany of, of this uh, wish to, to sort of dominate or to feel that power is the car, which is in itself uh, a sort of an absurd uh, energetic compression. Uh, and, and this is something also to keep in mind. Uh, for electric mobility, of course, it is, these numbers are very similar, right? Because the only difference you have is then uh, where, the, where the sort of the, the energy to mobilize comes from. So this has led to this increase in energy consumption over history, which is uh, super exponential, such as so many other things that we are using uh, as, um, as society. Uh, and we have currently no plan B in place to, to replace fossil fuels. So uh, we are, fossil fuels is one of the main arguments that, that we are actually getting rid of and, and transport and the car based system or the truck based system is, um, is, a, is, is sort of a short term uh, change that we, can, that we can easily do. But 
we are sort of uh, regardless of these uh, facts, you know, in our uh, post-factual uh, society, we are sort of moving on uh, with with the model that we are that we are having, uh, and and this leads to to a few sort of bottlenecks uh, over the over the next decades. So these are some numbers by the OECD, uh, basically. Uh, calculating the average number of trips uh, or the number of trips that are going to take place between 2015 and 2050. Uh, and of those uh, trips, there is uh, 54 uh, trillion trips, or 54 billion here, uh, to say it in European billions, uh, that, are, that are taking place between, uh, until 2050 that are, uh, that are sort of new. So there is a lot of new infrastructure that, it, that needs to be built. And the question is, uh, do we build motorways or uh, subway lines or how are, are we going to accommodate them? And of course, majority, vast majority urban, vast majority in uh, developing countries. Uh, and, and of course, this graph, sometimes you've, I always show this because uh, amongst activists, you always forget that actually the world is motorizing. It's not demotorizing, but there is more trips uh, in, in sort of combustion engines um, and, and there is even uh, sort of three, three very good reasons what, what uh, we state to sort of think, rethink that paradigm that, that we are building our cities on. This is, this is again Vienna. We also have nice uh, highways cutting through the city, not so many as other cities, but I just wanted to show some uh, images of Vienna that you maybe don't, uh, that you haven't seen before. Um, so, so the, a very long-term one is that, that we are running into planetary boundaries um, uh, in, in terms of uh, sort of the, what, what the planet can handle uh, of our waste and, and our energy use and, and so on and so forth. Um, of course, resource depletion with, uh, with uh, here uh, the energy or fossil fuels. Uh, and uh, one reason why we really need to, for example, think how are we going to power electric cars or uh, one reason why we will need to think about, okay, the main strategy will be to reduce overall footprint, uh, overall energy use and overall energy footprint is that we are uh, running into a, a situation where we will have less energy available uh, at less ideal um, um, conditions. This is uh, in this, in this uh, area of, of energy descent when, when sort of fossil fuels become less easily extractable. And of course, also for raw materials, we, we face uh, the same, a similar situation, uh, which is uh, a big question that some people use in terms of electrification. Maybe there will just not be uh, enough uh, raw earths available to, to create all those batteries that we are going to need. So um, less is more, especially in a time uh, of, of uh, climate change. Uh, and and uh, uh, emissions that are that are sort of uh, creating that that um, effect we we call greenhouse gas effect uh, or climate change lately um, and and the big end game or the the, the game we are playing now uh, is to to keep the planet at a sort of uh, uh, acceptable rate of warming and these are these famous two degrees of warming where you don't reach those tipping points like uh, melting of the, of the ice caps and so on and so forth. But the, the thing is that you, you run into a, a similar situation where you have rising demand uh, and, and then suddenly you should cope with a swift decline of what is still uh, available. So this clock is ticking and it's ticking very fast. And for the case of Austria, for example, we could keep up our current energy use for another 20 years, but then we would need to stop from one year to the other, you know, from one moment to the other. So we, we need to think constantly how we can reduce our, our overall footprint, but also how we can turn it into renewable uh, sources. This is, uh, if you would burn all the fossil fuels that are already sort of on the market that fossil fuels have, uh, that fossil fuel companies have their titles on already, then you run into a very dire situation with a lot of warning, uh, warming. Uh, so, um, so this is something that is questionable. Uh, you, we, we will just, we will not be able to do this when you when you think about it in a in a in the same way. And there is uh, thank, thanks to a lot of uh, 
people who are thinking about this, there is, there is a lot of uh, work on this. Um, uh, and, and it becomes very clear that if we really sort of continue in this dystopian future, that there will really be a situation that is maybe not, um, that, we, that we maybe not want. So the question is, do we, do we want runaway climate change where we have this huge warming uh, and all these negative consequences or do we decarbonize really rapidly? And so the question is, how, how can we achieve this, this uh, quick change, you know, this, this, uh, this very systemic change? Uh, but then you are faced with a sort of system where we recreate uh, our, our model, our values, our paradigms constantly and, and unconsciously. Um, uh, but we, we might think about uh, really thinking different in this system uh, and, 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 and creating a sort of different trajectory for the system. So the, um, what we are working with is this adaptive cycle uh, developed by Holding and others. Um, where, where you have a system going through different phases of, of, um, of uh, a sort of uh, innovation and, and, and re redefinition, you could say. Um, and, and there is always a, a, a chance to, to renew uh, sort of models uh, in, in, it, uh, in, in this sort of, uh, in, in the change of, of the system. So where if you, if you would see our sort of current situation, we would be in a sort of conservation phase seen for the car system where the, where the system sort of tries to conserve itself. Uh, but the danger here is if it becomes too conservative, then it's, it's trapped in its situation and it will not have uh, enough new resources available and so on and so forth. Um, so what you need to create is, is sort of uh, an opportunity for change and then you can have a radical, like, a, a radical innovation that's getting uh, released and the reorganization of a, of a system and a new uh, phase of exploitation where you can, where you can uh, build on, on this new, new uh, situation. So it's really at the moment, it's about creating this uh, window uh, as an opportunity for change. Um, and uh, there has been people talking about that for some time, that uh, when we think about how to change the system, you can be very effective if you change the, the ways we think about uh, what, what we are doing. So, so here, uh, when, when we say let's, let's change the intent of our actions, we can be very uh, effective in tipping the system. So paradigm change uh, or, and different systemic goals to change those can be very effective to sort of trickle down then into small decisions. So, um, so this is uh, sort of the system theoretic uh, input into this. And now let's look on uh, where does the paradigm come from for our car cities. And we have been looking at this yesterday a little bit. I'm uh, not going into detail about a lot of uh, the ideas that have been around, but basically this time in the 20s and 30s is really interesting for us at the moment because you have, uh, you had all these leading figures, uh, I think uh, to, to also reference on that exclusively male uh, interested or highly, almost exclusively male interested in creating sort of the future city, but uh, not out of bad intentions as we nowadays uh, always um, or, or very often make the mistake to assert. Uh, because, uh, the, you know, the urban condition back then was, was sort of uh, unsafe, you know, cars were newly coming to the street. It was uh, at times here in Paris, for example, it was uh, very unhealthy urban conditions still. So the wish was to create a new, uh, a new city that was better than the past. And in the case of the United States, of course, in the, in the end of the 20s, beginning of the 30s, uh, you had a dire economic situation. Um, where a sort of these new ideals and new visions for the city were, were highly sought of after. But of course, if you would imagine that this plan uh, was uh, for Paris here, where uh, Corbusier thought about tearing out the, the central um, neighborhoods in Paris and replacing them with, with these residential towers, um, uh, would be a, a nightmare if you would think it would have been realized. 
um, but but this sort of um, this this wish for a grand new scheme uh, was there also in examples what we saw yesterday from the broad acre city. So so there was this situation where where people create wanted to create a new city, and I think it's sort of comparable to what we have now because we are running into this situation where we are like okay that. Uh, the model of, of urbanism doesn't really work, and how can we create a new uh, a new city? Um, the the guy uh, I want to talk about today, and and the work uh, related to to this person is uh, Norman Belgedis, uh, who created the um, um, several visions for uh, car and oil companies in the 1930s. This is uh, a model he did in uh, in the 30s for the company Shell. Um, and back then you couldn't do a computer rendering. Uh, you, you could only build like a, a scale model, uh, often sort of like one to thousand, one to five hundred models um, of cities and then take a really good photograph of it to put it into, uh, as here, uh, Time magazine. And, uh, and he created this first. Of course, you see all the ideas, you know, that were interchanging uh, and, of course, influencing of, of uh, but in the center of it is, is huge uh, motorways uh, that, that mobilize uh, cars in a safe way um, and, and also in a quick way. And, and also this wish to, to create a, a future street, uh, a different sort of street that is orderly and safe and fast. And here you have a quote by Bel Geddes where he says like, okay, uh, in the street of the future, children will not play. And this is sort of exactly the opposite of what we are uh, Having now as a, as a goal, we said like now we want super areas where people, where children can play again. And when you look outside, this is uh, this is possible now in, in certain cases, some in certain places. Um, and the um, the big project that uh, Bel Gates then did for General Motors was uh, the pavilion uh, for the New York World's Fair in 1939, uh, which we sort of traced back as. Um, as an, uh, as an urban vision that sort of tried to sell the car to people. But the interesting thing here is not that it, that it was a, a grand urban vision, uh, but the interesting thing here that it was very desirable and it was done with the goal to sell a new urban model to, to a lot of people. You know, not only talking to planners or experts, or, but, but talking to, to the big crowds at the World's Fair. So this thing was seen um, by a lot of people over two years, by more than four million visitors. And, uh, and it was like the, the number one attraction um, at, at, the, at the World's Fair and people were standing in line to, to go in here uh, in, into, the, into the exhibition. This whole pavilion was called uh, Highways and Horizons. The whole World Fair had this motto uh, towards a new horizons. And, um, and here, of course, General Motors said highways and horizons, right? And then people went in. Uh, and, and in this area of, of the pavilion, there was this, this huge model laid out uh, where people were, were um, so first they, they, were, they were waiting here in front. And then they went inside where they were, were uh, watching uh, this uh, were they sort of were transported on a flyover perspective over this this new model, and then in the end they exited on this side and they saw a one-to-one -one scale of an intersection that was really orderly uh, and and with cars on the bottom and and safe pedestrians on the top. So here is the waiting, here is the people on a conveyor belt uh, watching this this model. It's um, it was about a 20-minute ride. You can basically go on YouTube and, uh, and uh, listen to the story. They, they made a movie about it also, and I will show a small excerpt. But it, in 1939, pretty, pretty uh, uh, high, uh, or, or pretty, um, how do you say, uh, well-developed uh, communication technique, you know, with inbuilt speakers uh, and the moving thing. And, and, um, and it must have been really impressive in a time where hardly anybody had a TV at home. Um, and, and of course, people flew over this, this new city of the future that the whole thing was also partly moving. It had 50,000 moving cars uh, in it, more than 100,000 trees, um, and, and there was a huge team working on it uh, to, to create this model. And then people exited uh, and, and, and saw this future intersection 
uh, where where they which was at the same time also a car show uh, to to present the new models of um, of General Motors and. Um, the interesting thing here is really that, that this dream of a new city was sold to a lot of people in a very effective way. And, um, and we think we need to do something for a, an urban condition beyond the car. Um, what people then, this is by the way Norman Bel Geddes, this, uh, he was a very influential designer at the time, a in, very interesting figure. Um, and at the end of the exhibition, people were giving uh, this pin which says, I have seen the future. So then you sort of, you were in the club and you knew what's going to happen and uh, best you decide on the car model to take home. Uh, and if it works, uh, we will have a three minute look into sort of what this, uh, uh, what, what, uh, what this story was and, and what the, the story was told should work. Switch off the light. about approaching the World Fair already. So you see here in New York. New horizons. This is the grounds of the World Fair. And people waiting for the Futurama. To help us get a glimpse into the future of this unfinished world of ours, there has been created for the New York World's Fair a thought-provoking exhibit of the developments ahead of us, the greater and better world of tomorrow that we in America are building today, a vivid tribute to the American scheme of living, whereby individual effort, the freedom to think, and the will to do have given birth to a generation of men who always want new fields for greater accomplishment and will always find new things for all others to enjoy. Come, let's travel into the future. So the what whole will we see? The whole exhibition was set in and the year now 1960. So 20 years in the future. The World's Fair exhibit modeled with such artistry and skill that we must continually remind ourselves the world we are now seeing is a vision, an artistic conception which may undergo many changes as it develops into the great realities of tomorrow. Here is a highway intersection, highway engineering at its most spectacular. Traffic may move safely and easily without loss of speed. By means of the ramped loops, cars may make right and left turns at rates of speed up to 50 miles per hour. Elevated and depressed are the turning off lanes. There is no interference from the straight ahead traffic in the higher speed lanes. The motorist of 1960 finds this intersection safe and efficient. And now we see an enlarged section of 1960's express motorway. Along the ledge of this beautiful precipice, traffic moves at unreduced rates of speed. Safe distance between cars is maintained by automatic radio control. Curved sides assist the driver in keeping his car within the proper lane under all circumstances. The keynote of this motorway, safety. Safety with increased speed. And now we see a great river city of 1960. 
20 years ago, the population of this city was approximately a million persons. It is much larger, rebuilt and repent. Residential, commercial and industrial areas all have been separated for greater efficiency and greater convenience. A quarter of a mile high skyscraper's tower with convenient rest and recreational facilities for all. On many of the buildings are landing decks for helicopters and autogyros. Rich in sunshine is the city of 1960. Fresh air, fine green parkways, recreational and civic centers. Modern and efficient city planning, breathtaking architecture, each city block a complete unit in itself. Here is an important intersection in the great metropolis of 1960. Elevated sidewalks give a new measure of safety and convenience to pedestrians. They actually double the available width for traffic in the street. And so, we see some suggestion of the things to come. A world which, far from being finished, is hardly yet begun. A world with a future in which all of us are tremendously interested. Because that is where we are going to spend the rest of our lives. In a future which can be whatever we propose to make it. So much for that. Um, we all know how, how this vision then turned out to become. And when you look nowadays, it, it often looks more like this. So the question is, how can we create a redux of this Futurama and, and sort of bring into our practice um, the, same, the same sort of scope of work, the same sort of positive attitude, the, the same sort of uh, ability to, to um, to talk to a lot of different people in different uh, groups or, or different different layers of society and, and sort of make them want uh, a future um, urban condition. And this is exactly the questions that we are uh, working on since uh, now two year, more than two years with our project Futurama Redux, um, uh, where, where we are um, sort of developing urban strategies and, and involving different stakeholders in, in a discussion uh, and creation, uh, or nowadays you say co-creation process uh, for, for creating this, this uh, future irresistible condition. So two of the, the tools um, that, that are sh worth sharing and, and I think that are interesting to consider is Imagineering and Backcasting. Um, that was not my computer, I think. I don't know where this came from. Um, but it's good to look it up on the internet, the film. Um, so Imagineering uh, would be basically to imagine a future state uh, and then afterwards think about the engineering about it. Um, very often we are unfortunately thinking first about the engineering and then about a future state that is possible. Uh, so simply by reversing those two things, you, you can, I think, uh, create different results. Uh, and the backcasting is to, to, um, to take a future condition uh, for our project. This was uh, Vienna in the year 2050 without the use of fossil fuels, just as the uh, original Futurama uh, said uh, 20 years in the future, uh, uh, a lot of uh, new uh, energy sources and no question where anything, uh, where all this energy comes from. We are saying uh, 20 years in the future, we, or 30 years in the future, we cannot use any fossil fuels anymore. What sort of condition do we need in cities to make that happen? Um, uh, so, so you can see uh, backcasting in relation to other uh, established planning uh, approaches. Um, 
And we did this with a team uh, and still doing this with a team uh, of, of designers. One of our designers in the initial team was, uh, this is no joke, working on the uh, film <coughs> The Fast and the Furious um, as a set designer. And uh, during a sabbatical, she was joining our design team. So we had a very interdisciplinary team of people that wanted to engage with that question, also with, um, uh, with experts. And the process that we're going through and that we're trying to expand in other cities too is the sort of creating this social sculpture of people who are, who are uh, thinking about this goal. And I think this conference here is also, uh, I, it's not part of our project of course, but it's also a sort of a, a social sculpture. And I think that this whole discussion that we are having uh, is, will not be over uh, after this conference and we might think to ex extend it or meet regularly. Um, so this was the, the exhibition in its, uh, its first state uh, in, in Vienna, um, sort of creating a space where, where, um, where uh, these, the, the, the things can be engaged with, just uh, similar to the idea of the Futurama pavilion where you can sort of enter and engage with the, with the future urban condition. Um, and, and then we have shown it in Hong Kong with different workshops, for example, but also in, in Zagreb or uh, in Seattle. And it was really interesting to bring it home uh, to the sort of home country of the, of the Futurama because, of course, these, these uh, future strategies mean something different in a city in the United States or in Latin America, but uh, are really relevant to, to try to apply them there. Uh, just the parts of the exhibition that we are that we are currently recreating or, or, or constantly reworking is um, in the beginning we show the sort of history, but I showed you that with the movie and the images already. So we we make people aware that uh, this this model of car-oriented urbanism is not a given or sort of uh, evolutionary fact, <laughs> or, or it it was something that was created uh, by intention or with a lot of effort. Uh, and then we sort of, uh, we take it out of context and, and we give a lot of information on what else is possible with, with cheap uh, fossil fuels. Um, and, and we tell the history backwards here. We start with 1850 and then we go into the future backwards. Um, and, and we show a sort of uh, a his mix of history and uh, future uh, imagineering. So here uh, we have all of these, these data points, what we create basically until now or these years, they are all sort of real and then starts the, the, the fake future or the envisioned future where we say, okay, this would be great if this, if this uh, could happen. But of course, um, the, the really main point is that, that we want people to go out of the exhibition and then be able to more easily imagine a different state of the future. Um, so, so what we also do with this is that uh, for the case of Vienna here, we, we expect that all the good intentions in the long-term strategic planning are going to be realized and are sort of building the foundation for, for our uh, research scenario that is used for backcasting the urban condition. So uh, the, the sort of core uh, of, of the project is, is a toolbox uh, of strategies that this is the first version. We are now working on a second version. Um, and, and that is, th these are things that, that uh, we, we <coughs> think would be the basis to, to realize um, a, a sort of decarbonization on an urban scale. So this, um, this entails, uh, in this case, 10 strategies and they, are, they, are, they go from governance or from sort of philosophical approach on seeing mobility to spatial strategies or energy uh, uh, spatial energy planning strategies uh, and they are then applied in, in sort of stories that, that people can, can read and, and can engage with. Um, and and in the, in the whole, on the whole uh, presentation you have the, uh, a scenario in the year 2015 here. Now we are updating it for a current scenario and the sort of desired state for 2050 that is <laughs> based on conversations with experts and, uh, and extrapolations. So for mobility, for Vienna, what, what we have as a provocative uh, uh, scenario is to basically switch the trips between uh, car and bikes. So to say the motorized car will more or less have the, the mode share uh, 
in the future, now the motorized car has 27% and the bike has 7% and in the future we say the motorized car has 5% uh, and, and the bike sort of takes over on these trips. Uh, this is um, the, the speculative part of our scenario, but uh, the interesting thing is what becomes possible with this. So if you, uh, if you reduce the, 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 the mode share for cars from 27, 27 is like uh, any other forward looking European city. It's, it's more or less like what you have in Barcelona. It's more or less what you have uh, in, um, yesterday I read 25% for Barcelona. It depends how you, how you calculate it. Um, uh, or, or Copenhagen or Amsterdam, they, we, these cities still have between a, a quarter and, and a third of, of motorized individual um, transport. But uh, in Vienna, this means these 27% currently mean that we have 300 cars per 1,000 people. And when you say you reduce it to these 5% and all these 5% are shared uh, and, um, and electrified, uh, then you, you suddenly only have uh, about 20 cars per 1,000 people that are necessary. And it completely opens all the public space for new uses. Uh, and, and this is something, you have seen this in, in different versions before, but we said uh, we should also consider how much energy is actually necessary to create uh, the, a sort of mobility, and then you can very easily prioritize uh, the, the, the forms of mobility and also diversify that sort of top end where, where you have very low input of, of energy, but it also differentiates automatically if you sort of use a gadget or not. Um, and of course, uh, electric mobility, in, even if it's shared, is, is sort of doesn't, it, it never compares to, to self-powered transport. Um, another concept that we, are, that we are promoting is uh, negotiated flow, is sort of a shared space on a, on a larger scale, um, something that, that we are interested in because we propose that it, that it would significantly reduce uh, speeds, but also allow uh, that the, the, um, that the urban space to take a different shape and is something that's becoming interesting in connection with autonomous vehicles as well. But of course, with uh, very few autonomous vehicles. Um, then we are thinking about what sort of different streets we could, we could build uh, using streets for as linear parks, as productive places, as uh, places for energy generation, uh, communal spaces, etc., and so on and so forth. So th um, and, and then of, uh, we, we also try to implement the, the concept of uh, super rias or super manzanas or super blocks for Vienna and we, we also uh, included um, different aspects of it, uh, sort of uh, on a political side, we thought what could, uh, what could be possible or could it be possible to see the superblock as a sort of smallest political unit in, in a city? So to how, how can you create the, the community uh, within it? Uh, it would be the, an, a unit for spatial energy planning, so you would have uh, a sort of energy accounting on a superblock basis and sort of input output, how much energy does, it, does the superblock use, how much uh, can you create with it and so on and so forth. Um, so the interesting thing here is of course how can you put a superblock into a, a non-Barcelona grid, but it's something that's also other cities as we saw yesterday are, are achieving. And then we go deeper into one of the super logs and, and we tell different stories what, what would be uh, our, our goal uh, for, for Vienna. Um, so here you see that, that um, this, this method of, of sort of accounting the resilience uh, of, a, of a given amount of space is this resilience audit that, that uh, considers different factors such as energy or productivity or health uh, of, of a given area and then you, you can sort of use it as a strategic planning tool to improve uh, some of these conditions. Um, and, and then some of the, we are, we are just uh, showing some of these stories to people, so how would an open street or Ciclovia event in, in Vienna look like? Uh, what sort of ground floor activation do we need uh, to, to make that um, happen uh, and what could different streetscapes look like and what sort of function also in an ecologic sense uh, we could realize. And then in our exhibition people exit and they get a button where it says we have seen the future 
because we sort of we already have seen it in, in a way and uh, we know what we need to do but we need to realize and we need to build it uh, and we can do it together uh, and this is also what we are doing uh, uh, so then then people sort of stand in this imaginative space uh, where we took one intersection in, in Vienna uh, and, and people sort of almost on a one-to-one -one scale can start to imagine how this, uh, how this future urban condition could look like. So you have different, uh, on a very subtle way, different things realized there, uh, such as energy generation, but also there is no, no hierarchy or very little hierarchy. Uh, of course, a lot of active transport uh, and so on and so forth. The buildings have been transformed to accommodate climate change adaptation and, and, and so on. Um, we are currently working on a 2.0 version of this. Um, where, where we are expanding this, this toolbox, so, so it's ongoing. And that's why I'm very happy to be here uh, and to share uh, and get feedback. And uh, I hope we still have time for some, for some discussion. Yes.